everyone, welcome to this lecture on confidence intervals, type one and two errors, and p-values. I decided to make one lecture for all of these topics, given that they're heavily interrelated, and knowing one of them will make it a lot easier to know the other. So I felt it was most appropriate to talk about them at the same time. So first, starting with confidence intervals, we most often talk about 95% confidence intervals. Um, and really what a confidence interval is, is that whenever we're doing a study, we're taking a sample of patients, doing some sort of analysis, and then trying to make a conclusion that can be applied to the population at large. In doing so, because we're not looking at the whole population, only a subset of it, there's gonna be some imprecision in terms of our point estimate. And the confidence interval is really what we use to quantify the degree of imprecision that we would expect. And really to think about what is the range of possible point estimates that we you know, truly may have, may have gotten if we were to repeat this study over and over again with different samples of the main population. The way that we calculate a 95% confidence interval is we take our point estimate and then we add or subtract the standard error times 1.96. So 1.96 comes from the fact that about 95% of the data should lie within two standard deviations of the point estimate assuming a semi-normal distribution. This is a topic that we'll talk about in a future lecture. Really what I wanna focus on is the standard error component because standard error is calculated by taking the standard deviation and dividing it by the square root of the sample size. So one commonly tested concept related to confidence intervals is that as sample size or N increases, standard error will decrease because we're making the denominator larger. This will cause the confidence interval to be more narrow, and this will lead to an increase in statistical power. And statistical power is the ability to reject the null hypothesis, assuming the null hypothesis is not true, which we'll talk about a little bit later in this lecture. But this is a heavily tested concept and something to always keep in mind. Now, in terms of um, interpreting confidence intervals, I think it's important to really think about what is like the null hypothesis? What are we often doing when we're performing analyses? So one core principle is that for null hypotheses, which is the, the kind of hypothesis that we assume to be true and that we have to disprove in order to you know, say we have a statistically significant finding, the null hypothesis is that there is no difference between groups that X equals Y with you know, group one having a mean of X and group two having a mean of Y, for example. So for example, if we have a study where we're comparing a placebo to some new therapy to reduce risk of some disease, the null hypothesis is that the treatment doesn't work and the burden of proof is put on the investigator to reject that null hypothesis in favor of you know, a potential alternative hypothesis that the treatment is better or worse than placebo. Often when people think about the null hypothesis, they think that uh, you know, the null hypothesis should be an answer of one. But something that's really important is that the null hypothesis depends upon whether you're dealing with a ratio measure or a difference measure. So if you're dealing with a ratio measure, such as a relative risk or an odds ratio, in that case, the null hypothesis would be one because we're looking at x over y. So if we assume x equals y, that value would be one. However, if we're looking at a difference measure, such as a difference in means, such as you know, the, comparing the mean systolic blood pressure among patients getting placebo compared to patients getting an antihypertensive medication, in that case, we're doing x minus y. So if x equals y, the null would actually be zero. And one really core principle of biostatistics that might be the most tested concept on the test is that if a 95% confidence interval includes the null value, so one for a ratio measure or zero for a difference measure, that result is not statistically significant and therefore has a p-value greater than 0.05. This comes up over and over on the test through the drug ad questions. Um, so this is a really important concept to know. And it's basically because if the 95% confidence interval includes the null value, then within our degree of imprecision that occurs from taking a sample and trying to make broad conclusions for the population, it is not implausible that the true value that we are trying to uh, assess 
is the null value. And therefore, we don't have enough support to reject the null hypothesis. And therefore, we do not have a statistically significant finding. And there, and you know, we we often agree that we need a p-value less than 0.05 in order for it to be statistically significant. And that's why p would be greater than 0.05. I mean, I'll talk a little bit about the interpretation of p-values in a second. So now moving into our final square, it's important to really think about the types of errors that can occur when performing an analysis. So the two main types of errors that can occur are a type one error and a type two error. With a type one error being when we reject the null hypothesis, when the null hypothesis is actually true, and a type two error being when we fail to reject the null hypothesis, when the null hypothesis is not true. And I always remember, a type two error is when we fail to reject the null hypothesis. So type two error, fail to reject the null hypothesis. And if we think about these errors in terms of the alpha and beta coefficients, type one error is equal to alpha, which is a value that's set by researchers. And this is you know, the 0.05 that we always talk about with p-values. You know, basically we say, we set the p-value at 0.05 because we accept, we accept a type one error of 0.05 in terms of something being meaningful in terms of a result. In contrast, we see that a type two error is beta. And a type two, as a type two error goes down, the power goes up. And again, the power is the ability to reject the null hypothesis, assuming the null hypothesis is false. And as we talked about in the upper um, quadrant, as sample size increases, we get an increase in power because our standard error will decrease and our confidence interval will narrow, allowing us to make more precise estimates. So one really key concept is that as sample size increases, we get an increase in power and a decrease in our type two error, but we have no effect on our chance of a type one error. The chance of a type one error, the 0.05, is something that is set by researchers and doesn't change with changes in sample size. And that's something that they commonly like to test. Lastly, I just want to talk about what is really, what is a p-value? Like, what are we actually saying when we think about a p-value? So say we get a p of 0.04. What we're saying is that there is a 4% chance of seeing a result as extreme or more extreme as the one that was obtained by chance alone, assuming that the null is true. And we, just as a medical and statistical community, have accepted a P less than 0.05 as being statistically significant. We accept, we accept a 5% chance of incorrectly rejecting the null hypothesis. Because say something has a P of four, P of 0.04, it would be very rare for that to occur, assuming the null is true. And therefore, we feel that is sufficient evidence to reject the null hypothesis, because it would be really rare to get a result that would only be seen 4% of the time, assuming the null was true. So we accept the null likely isn't true, and we feel confident rejecting the null. Again, this is just an arbitrary cutoff that is set by the researchers with the consensus of 0.05 being used in the medical literature and in the um, MBME exams. And really the main takeaway is that if you get a statistical test with a p-value less than 0.05 on your MBME exam, that is a statistically significant result. So I know this was a lot of topics and a lot of content. So I really encourage you to try the associated practice problems um, to really see if you can apply this knowledge in a question format. As always, like, comment, subscribe, and good luck.